One of the biggest mistakes we make is that we confuse inexperience with being unqualified. One of the most important questions that I get asked over and over and over and over again, people are struggling with, what do I do with my life? The most successful people in the world, healthy, wealthy or wise, choose education over entertainment. Rise and shine, it's espresso time. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael and I am not a morning person, I'm not. But when you start your day off with a powerful routine that inspires you, like watch one of these videos, it will change your life. So let's start your day off right together, grab your coffee, know that I believe in you, and get ready for a shot of espresso from Jay Shetty. I wake up every morning. Espresso, keep me going. One of the biggest mistakes we make is that we confuse inexperience with being unqualified. So because we've not tried a lot of things, we just naturally believe that we can't be that good at them. Mm -hmm. So if I've never spoken on a stage, I just think, oh, I'm probably not good at that. Or if I've never played golf, I'd probably think, oh, I'm probably not good at that. And so we start writing off things without even trying them. So the best method I can share with someone is take the next month, take the next four weekends in the month that gives you eight days and get really tactical every single day. That's why you're playing tennis a lot right now. Yeah, play tennis. <laughs> take the eight days, go join a course, an online course, a workshop, go and shadow a friend, go to a seminar, a conference, go to reading a book, listen yeah. to a podcast. Go and expose yourself to eight different things in a month. Eight different things. Eight different things mm -hmm. in a month. And guess what, in a month, you will have learned what you probably would have learned in eight years because mm -hmm. most of us test one new thing a year. Maybe. Maybe, if that, exactly, mm -hmm. right? Like some people don't even do that. But if you do eight different things in a month, and this is how you have to see it. If you went to eight different restaurants in a month, you ask yourself after you eat a meal, like I had that burrito or I had that taco, did I like it? Right, the first question you ask yourself is you, did I you like it? You gotta try it first. You gotta try it first, you yeah. gotta go to the restaurant. Yeah. There's no point, so you gotta say did I like it? The second question you ask yourself is, why did I, or why did I not like it? Mm -hmm. Like why is so important? I think too many people just yeah. go, I like it or I don't like it, why didn't I like it? And the third question you have to ask yourself, really, really simple is, do I wanna do it again? Mm. And if you do, that's where you start uncovering. So my point is, inexperience, do not misinterpret inexperience for a lack of qualification. What do I do with my life? One of the most important questions that I get asked over and over and over and over again, people are struggling with, what do I do with my life? You see your parents doing something, you see your friends doing something, you know that that's not the life that you want, but you're afraid of actually chasing down your dreams. You see people living their life on Instagram and it's so beautiful and perfect, and you're worried that you're not gonna measure up, that you're not gonna live up to it, that if you try and do your thing, you're gonna fail. And so you're constantly stuck in this, what do I do with my life? Pull between the safe life that everybody around you is living and they want you to live for yourself or the dream life that you know you're capable of but you don't know quite what it looks like. What do I do with my life? Here's what I found. You're gonna have moments in your life where you have absolute clarity and equally you'll have moments in your life where you have zero clue what to do. <laughs> Let's break those two down. When you have absolute clarity, when you know exactly what you wanna do, when it feels right, when you have momentum, the best thing you can do is put your blinders on and go to work. The best thing you can do is shut down everything else and get to work building your dream. We often hedge, we often play small, we often don't put as much in because we're afraid. But when you have those moments of clarity, you have to go play a bigger game. You have to start betting on yourself. Right now, I look at my YouTube channels as an example. This is a pretty special moment in time. And things are very well aligned for me right now. I mean, been doing YouTube for 12 years, built up a lot of traction, have a lot of momentum, been helping a lot of my friends, made a lot of new friends as a result of the channel, got into rooms that otherwise I shouldn't be in because of the success of my channels. And it's been a lot of work. And the early years did not pay off very well at all. I share on my Instagram uh, a lot of my traction and you know, first five years of the channel, 
We didn't even have 10,000 subscribers in the first five years. And then we went and hit, you know, next five years, 2 million subscribers. Now passing 3 million subscribers on the main channel. But a lot of, a lot of slow, slow, slow growth. But right now is a very special moment in time. Right now, I need to push harder on the YouTube channels. Right now, we've launched, I don't know how many channels, a lot of channels. We've got a dozen channels plus maybe at this point. I need to be pushing more on YouTube. This is a moment in time. This is the window here is so wide open that I need to jump through it because at some point it will close. And and I don't want to look back on this moment and say, I wish I pushed harder. I wish I wasn't afraid. I wish I, I did the thing that I knew was right. And we'll have it. Uh, you'll have those moments too in your life where you just see it so clearly. You you have this vision. You you see it all working out, but you're afraid to go actually take the action. You're afraid to go all in on it. You're afraid to do what is necessary. And then what ends up happening is regret because you'll be at the end of your life or even 10 years later thinking, I, I knew it. I saw it so clearly. There was this opportunity in front of me and I wanted to do it and I loved to do it, but I was too afraid and somebody went else, somebody else went off and made millions of dollars off of my idea. Does that ever happen to you? Somebody made millions off of my idea. Well, no, they just went and took action when you were sitting being afraid. And so when you have those moments of clarity, you have to push everything else aside and go after that thing. Even though it's scary, even though it's too big, even though it feels beyond you, you have to go after that thing because that's where your genius lies. And you either lean into your genius and go change the world or you live the rest of your life with regret. You have to force it. So that's when you have absolute clarity. You'll also have moments in your life where you have no idea what to do zero clue like I don't know what to do next all I know is I don't want to be doing what I'm doing right now did that ever happen to you you know that you don't like your current life you know that you don't like your current habits you know that you don't like your current schedule your routine what you're doing who you're hanging with you know you don't like any of that stuff but you don't know what to do to change it has that happened if that's you right now then your immediate goal is the exact opposite it's not to go all in on one thing, it's to try many things, to give yourself a lot of exposure, to say yes to as many things as possible that are inside your code of ethics, right? Don't go steal something from a store because it's something new, <laughs> right? That are inside your code of ethics. To taste, to test, to try to explore, to find the thing that might be the next thing for you. And to lower the barrier for just getting started. So I went through this in my website. When I had my website, a lot of people don't know me from my website because if you go to my website now, there's not that much there, but I used to have 100,000 plus pages of content on my website and I was playing the SEO game and publishing tons of content and, and we had a lot of the big name people uh, in entrepreneurship creating content for our website and I was selling ads off the site and I realized at the beginning, I was all in. At the beginning, I loved it. I wanted to write. I wanted to bring on people. I wanted to, we had 5,000 people or so writing for the website. I loved it, it was all in. I saw this moment in time, I was going for it. And we quickly grew the website. But I found that as in maybe year three, year four, I was starting to lose interest. It wasn't exciting anymore. And I didn't know what else to do inside the website to bring that energy back. So I started to taste, test, explore other things outside the website. And one of those experiments was YouTube. One of those tests was me starting my first YouTube channel. And I really sucked at it. <laughs> <laughs> you can go back and watch my old videos. It took me a long time to get half decent in front of the camera. I sucked at it. I had no natural inclination for it. Uh, I told myself, well, I'm I'm an introvert and I'm shy, so I'm, I'm always going to suck on camera. But I realized, I don't know, I just, I liked it. I liked it. I liked doing it. I liked making visual content instead of written content because I'm a visual learner. I liked the idea that maybe there's somebody else out there who'll watch my video and be inspired by it. And that maybe makes a shift for them. I never expected to be YouTube famous because at the time YouTube famous wasn't a thing. Nobody was YouTube famous, especially in education. Nobody was making long form educational videos. It just didn't exist. 
And so I thought, you know what? I'll just keep doing it because I love it. That if 50 people, 100 people watch this video, that's 50 to 100 people who watch the video. That's maybe a couple of lives changed because of me being courageous enough at the time to press record and make a video. And so that kept me that kept me going. And eventually that turned it into something that then I shut down my website and it went all in on YouTube. And so when you don't know what to do, you need to get out of your typical routine, go for a walk, go to go, go drive somewhere you've never been before, take an extra long shower, like do the things that help get you create creative ideas. And then whatever comes, whether it's start a YouTube channel, start a podcast, start writing a book, start singing a song, start like whatever ideas come to you, they will probably sound crazy. For someone like me, it would be crazy to have a YouTube channel. For someone who doesn't like being in front of the camera, who doesn't like seeing himself, who, who thought that people who filmed themselves had to have a huge ego and be chasing fame when I didn't want that. For someone like that, I would have never said, never, never, that I would have a hundred thousand subscribers, you know, let alone three million plus. Never, I would have never thought that was possible. And so a lot of times these new ideas that we come up with seem impossible, feel impossible. For someone like you to do something like that, there's no way that that's gonna happen. And so we've already lost out of the gate because you don't give yourself permission to try. You've set these impossible benchmarks and milestones for yourself and the lack of belief in yourself means that you don't even do it. So reduce that barrier, bring it down to nothing. Just start, just experiment, just create your first video, record your first podcast, sing your first song, write your first page of a book, right? Try that one thing. And the only thing that matters is did you like the thing? Do you want to go back and do it again? Was it enjoyable? Whether you got a result or not, you probably won't get a good result. Your first thing will suck. Expect it to suck. But did you like the thing? Do you want to go back and do it again? Was it actually fun as opposed to being a chore? Because the more that you keep doing the things that you actually find fun doing, you can, guess what? You're going to get better at it. You're going to get better at it, right? Like if you actually like the, learning the thing, you're going to get better at it. Think about all the stuff you learned in school that you never actually learned. It's you just memorized and it's gone versus the thing that you actually enjoy doing. That's the stuff that actually sticks. So you can get great at any skill if you actually love doing it and it doesn't feel like work. And so that becomes the immediate job is to figure out what is the thing that you potentially will love doing and to say yes to you say yes to every idea that comes in your head. Stop judging the results of them. Give yourself permission to start small, to fail small and just pay attention to do you love that thing? Can you wait to go back and do it again? So this happens for everybody. This will happen multiple times in your life. There will be moments where you have absolute clarity, absolute certainty. You know what you need to do next. You feel it in your bones. You have to go do it and you have to play bigger. You have to stop being afraid. You have to go all in on that thing because that window will close and you will regret not going bigger when you had the chance. And then when you have those moments where you have no idea what to do, you're of zero clue, you feel completely lost. That's when you have to explore. Get out of your comfort zone, get out of your usual routine, go for a walk, listen to that creative inspiration that does come, stop judging those ideas and just starting them and giving yourself the permission to fail because you will find the next big thing. And this is roller coaster <laughs> effect that will happen many times in your life of absolute clarity and zero clarity. And maybe those cycles last weeks, months, years for YouTube has been over a decade and I'm still going strong on it. But at some point that's going to shift to something else and that's okay. And that's normal. So recognize where you are at within your life right now. Where are you right right now? Do you have absolute confidence and clarity or do you have zero confidence and clarity? And then take the right step forward. Now I've got some special bonus clips that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week. When you just watch a video and get motivated, you have a 35% chance of actually doing something, making a change. That's what the sign says. 35%, that's not enough, Believe Nation. But 
when you watch a video, you get motivated, and then you create a specific plan of action for what you're going to do, it jumps to 91% chance of you following through. And when you commit publicly, like put it in the comments below what your plan is, it jumps to 95%. So, Believe Nation, your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week, put it down in the comments below so I can celebrate with you. Hey everyone, I have been reading a bit from my friend's book, Evan Carmichael, Built to Serve, and I wanted to share this with you. So, according to a study by Carnegie Mellon University, people with supportive spouses are more likely to give themselves the chance to succeed. They studied 163 married couples and found that people with supportive spouses were more likely to take on potentially rewarding challenges. Those who accepted challenges experienced more personal growth happiness and psychological well-being. Now, I can truly say that I've experienced that in my life. When I first met my wife, I was just starting out. I had never released a video. I hadn't created any content. And she was such an important part of feeling supported on that journey. So whether you're in a relationship, whether you're dating, whether you're married, or even if you're single, being supported by friends and a strong community is important. Uh, Build to Serve by Ellen Carmichael, great book on how you can find your purpose and also on reminding us that we can all make a difference in the world. Thanks, Evan. A young boy once asked his teacher, what's the difference between I like you and I love you? The teacher beautifully answered, well, it's like a flower. If you like a flower, you pluck it. But if you love a flower, you water it and nurture it daily and watch it grow. There is such a thin line between like and love. And because of it, we make so many mistakes in our relationships. When we want something in the moment, we take it and don't think any further. We do whatever we want to get that feeling of pleasure, not realizing that we're neither satisfied by that pleasure and nor will that thing last. When we pluck a flower, not only will that flower die, but we can't experience it for any longer than that moment. When you water it and take care of it daily, you can experience it forever. We've been wired towards an instant gratification, instant pleasure mindset. All of the adverts that we see, whether they're online or offline, are geared to driving us towards making instant decisions for instant promises of pleasure. The catch is, not only does that instant pleasure not satisfy us, the feeling doesn't last. We're so used to seeing all the strap lines and headlines on the internet. Learn this language in five minutes. Get the ideal body in 10 minutes a day. Become a millionaire in 12 months. Now all of these sound brilliant, right? The problem is, they're not real. They're not true. They're false promises. The reason why it works is because it appeals to one of the most basic human desires. Situational improvement without major resource investment. Of course you can pick up a few words in another language or shed a few pounds of weight if that was your goal. Or maybe you will make a little bit more money. But real knowledge, real awareness, real fitness, real business, all of these things take time. Real relationships, real connection, real purpose takes time. Naturally, the internet headlines focus on the short term instead of the long term. Because most of us would never click on something if it said, learn a language in five years with dedicated daily practice. We wouldn't click on something that said, here is the one hour workout that you need to do every single day. And we wouldn't click on the one that said, if you want to be a millionaire, here are the 10 failures that you will go through in year one, how broke you might be by year three, and you may not even make it by year nine. The important lesson here is, if you want meaning, if you want purpose, if you want fulfillment, those things take time. You talked about the fear of fear and how you had to learn to let go of your fear of fear. What does it actually mean, letting go of the fear of fear? Yeah, so I talk about how we fear the wrong things. What do we fear? So most of us are fearful of how our friends are reacting, what's happening on social media, and what's the random bit of news that we heard. 
None of it is fact-based. That's one of the biggest issues it's that worry we have. Based. It's worry-based. And it's also imagination-based. So we become fiction writers. We've all watched too many movies. <laughs> Now we start writing these beautiful movies in our head, we're not beautiful, scary movies yes. in our head of what may happen. So our imagination, and Seneca said it best, we suffer twice, one in reality and one in imagination. Mm. Right? We suffer twice. And this is the What actually happens to us, totally. and then the story we continue to tell totally. ourselves. Now there's this incredible study in the book that I have to talk about. So tell they me. took monks and they took non-monks and they, they said, competed against each they other. They competed against <laughs> each other, literally. So they put this plate where you experience heat. And so what happens is the non-monks touch this plate. Now this plate heats up gradually, softly, uh -huh. and then at one point it gets really hot for 10 seconds and then it cools down. And so what happened is that when the non-monks touched it, the anxiety and pressure and stress in their brain just triggered straight away, even though it wasn't that hot. It wasn't hot. It, it was heating, but it wasn't gotcha. hot to do anything major to you. But the anxiety and stress in imagination or in anticipation went through the roof in the non-monks. Now this is what's fascinating. When the monks touched it, they showed that it didn't feel anything as it rose, but as it got to its highest, they felt physical pain, but they showed no trigger of emotional pain because they did not assign any emotional element to that pain. So my point with that is, you can look at the news right now and you can get scared straight away and get in complete freeze mode, feeling stuck, paralyzed, whatever it is, because what you're now doing is you're creating a story of what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And that story- And you can cause sickness in yourself. You can cause sickness inside yourself. Just by the story, yourself. not actually- The reality. The, the, the facts of the disease hitting you or something happening physically to you. Totally. And that story, again, can be used positively. So your story may actually be true. But if it's gonna right. be true, now you can prepare. Mm -hmm. And that shifts you away from being scared because now you're preparing. Yes. And so the real You can be answer, confident because you prepared. Exactly. And so we should be shifting our fear energy into preparation energy. Because what fear does is it keeps you locked there, mm. right? We just feel stuck. I'll give you an example. Like when you were preparing for big games, when you used yes. to play in the NFL, yes. right? And you're playing American football against some of the biggest athletes in the world. It's like, you can either sit there and be scared that you're gonna play this game on the weekend, uh -huh. or you can prepare. And yeah. your confidence is in the preparation. So when people go, how do I feel confident right now? Are you preparing? Are you putting the reps? Are you putting the reps? Yeah. Are you building your immunity? Mm -hmm. Are you taking your vitamins? Are you drinking lots of water? Are you drinking lots of water? Are you taking the steps that are needed to prepare for whatever's coming? You will feel more confident that way. Yeah. One of my biggest beliefs, and I read a study that inspired my beginning, and it was that the most successful people in the world, healthy, wealthy, or wise, choose education over entertainment. And the most unsuccessful people in the world, unhealthy, unwealthy, or unwise, choose entertainment over education. So I made it my mission in life to build entertainment first content with an educational heart. And I was thinking, how do we make wisdom spread at the pace people want entertainment? How do we meet people where they are so that they can come on a journey with us? How do we meet people? Because guess what? Hundreds of thousands of people will do courses, millions of people will come to events, but billions will always watch television and network TV and online programming. How do we meet people there? So a big part of my vision and goal is to create conscious content that will sit on all the platforms that everyone binge watches, will be extremely entertaining that you won't even know, but it will have the most meaningful messages behind it. At 18, I was really fortunate when I met a monk. And this monk was invited to speak. And I kind of just went because one of my friends forced me to. At that time, I was listening to CEOs and entrepreneurs and business people and marketers who, who I thought that's what I was aspiring to be like. And then I hear this monk. And he captivated me like no one had ever captivated me before. It was like staring at the most beautiful woman on the planet. You know, I was completely fixated on him and his message. See, we live in echo chambers. We're just surrounded by the same thinking. How often do you bump into a monk? You know, it just doesn't happen. You don't have, no one has a dinner party and goes, oh yeah, we just invited the monk, you know, from <laughs> town, like the local monk. Like no one ever does that. And so you, we meet people who are just like us most of the time. And we talk about this in business all the time. If you want to be a billionaire, spend time with billionaires. If you want to be a millionaire, spend time with millionaires. If you want to be a tech startup, spend time with, you know, that's, that's the common rhetoric that we hear all the time. But what if you want to find purpose and master the mind? There's no one better than a monk who's mastered the mind. 
So, so for me, the first step is just opening yourself up to new experiences and new role models. Because most of us can't see ourselves in people, so then we try and fit ourselves into the boxes that we do see. And, and I mean, there's this beautiful quote that I, I've been saying it everywhere and I wish I wrote it, but I didn't. So it's by a philosopher and writer named Cooley. And he said that today, I'm not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. Right? And just let that blow your mind for a moment. <laughs> it's, uh, it's so powerful. I'm not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. So we live in this perception of a perception of ourselves. Hence, my identity is made by what my parents think I should be. My identity is made up by what my college or university thinks I should achieve. While you're living in that bubble and that echo chamber, getting to what you really want to do is impossible because maybe that just doesn't fit. And I think so many people feel that way today that they don't fit into the current education system. They don't fit with the three or four or five careers that you're taught exist. So that process of self-excavation and actualization first requires being exposed. You can't be what you can't see. If I never saw a monk, I would never have wanted to be a monk. If I never meet a billionaire, I wouldn't want to be one because I wouldn't know what that feels like. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what it takes. And, and I think that's the biggest challenge of our society, that we're not exposed. So that's the first step, being exposed to unique experiences and role models. Second step is finding that experience or role model that you're passionate about, and exactly like you said, taking it seriously. Shadow them, network with them, spend time with them, observe them, even from afar. It takes that observation, being addicted to observing that person's lifestyle. And then the third step is going yes or no. Does that work for me? Not everyone who's gonna go off and become a monk is gonna feel like the way I did, and that's cool. But not everyone is gonna go and follow and shadow a billionaire and go, that's exactly the lifestyle I want. They may want the result, but do they want the hard work that goes with it? And so for me, that's the third step. It's observing, focusing, shadowing, getting as close to the process of that individual, and then going yes or no. Do I want that process? Not do I want the result? Mm. Everyone wants to be that monk who's fully enlightened, you know, can walk through, has an incredible aura that people just gravitate towards. But when you realize he has to wake up at 2 a.m. every day and sleeps about four to six hours, you're like, ah, you know, I don't want to do that. <laughs> that. That doesn't sound like me. How many of you spend a lot of your days multitasking? Okay, good. So a lot of us spend our time multitasking. Now, studies show that only 2% of us are actually able to multitask. And when most people hear that, they're like, yeah, I'm in that 2%. <laughs> That's me, right? I'm in that 2%. Uh, you're probably not, I'm not, because it's only 2% of the global population of the world. Multitasking is a myth. And I find that as spiritual activists, as conscious change makers, as change agents of the world, whatever you want to call yourself, all of us, one of the biggest mistakes we've seen, and this was the quote that I shared and a thought from Martin Luther King that I've really held close to me, is he said, those who love peace need to learn to organize themselves as well as those who love war, mm -hmm. right? Those who love peace need to learn to organize themselves as well as those who love war, i.e. people who are trying to build destruction in the world and distractions in the world are highly organized, highly focused, highly data-oriented, highly strategic, highly process-driven. And so we have to be the same. And when you spend time with Vision, or you spend time with the Mind Valley team, you realize their success is intuitive, it is deep, it is full of love, but it is also highly strategic, it is also highly focused, and therefore it's effective. And so for me, my plea to all of you and to myself is whatever we're gonna do, let's get really strategic about it. Let's bring sincerity and strategy together. Let's bring data and dynamism together. Let's bring intuition and insight together. Right? Let's, not, let's not look beyond that and think, oh, that stuff's gonna work out because I inten my intention's nice. Right? Your intention's not gonna run a mile, but it will help you run the marathon. But it's not gonna run that mile that you need to do right now. And so for me, intention and action, intention and attention, both of them are required. And so my recommendation is whatever your dream is, whatever you're inspired by, whatever you think is gonna have a positive impact on the world, bring both to that. 
right? Don't settle for one or the other. We're wired for generosity, but we're educated for greed. I think I just Gosh, said it to you two years ago so when I was good, on the podcast. Yes. It's like, and, and when I said that in the statement, so it was, a, and it's so true, we're wired for generosity, oh but we're educated for greed. Because what happens is, when we're kids, you'll see kids you share. share, go out their way, they wanna share. It's yeah. part of my candy bar, whatever, totally. right? Yeah. yeah, and then as we get older, we're told that there's less, and this is what the key is. As we get older, we're told there are finite numbers of how many kids get made on the basketball or baseball team. Yes. We're told there's We're a limited. finite number of college spaces. We're told there's a finite number of how many tickets there are. We're told there's a finite number of people that are successful. Guess what? In the theater of happiness, there are infinite and unlimited seats. And there is a seat <laughs> with your name on it. That's okay. There is a seat with your name on it in the theater of dreams, in wow. the theater of happiness. But you think that because you think that there are only 100 people allowed in, that if someone else makes it before you, that you don't get in. And guess what? Is there a cap on how many billionaires there are in the world? No. No. Is there a cap on how many millionaires there are in the world? No. no. Is there a cap on how many happy people there are in the world? No. no. And that's why I really am encouraging Forbes. I want Forbes, forget printing a rich list, happiness. print a happy list, wow. print a service list, print wow. a list of who is serving. We should serving, do that, we should do who that. Who is serving the most in the world. Wow, right? that'll, be, that'll be competition Talk, based. Yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> I gave more than you yeah, gave. And that's why it should be service based on time, energy, and money. Uh -huh. Because we should start showing how much time people give, mm -hmm. how much energy people give. Mm -hmm. Mother Teresa, I don't think she gave any money to her charities. Right. But she gave a lot of time and energy. Yeah. You know, you look at all the people who made a change in the world, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, like, they may not have given a lot of money to stuff. Yeah. They you, gave time and energy. You don't have to give resources, but your resourcefulness, your love, your time, love that. your focus, your attention, your compassion. Love that. Uh, you yeah. know, resourcefulness of the of the heart, not of the wallet. I think is love key. that. And you don't need to have a lot of money to make a big impact. You don't. Yeah. There's and and this is the training. See, we've been educated for greed because we've been told everything's limited. There's limited number of this, limited number of this, number. And every time you play in numbers, and I think it was Bob Marley who said it, but every time you play in numbers, you'll always be dissatisfied because uh, guess what? Someone's gonna always have more. Someone's always gonna have more. I was speaking to a friend recently, and and it's, and, and this friend was telling me that he uh, you know, bought a home, which is very expensive. Yes. Uh, very, very expensive. And he went to a party at someone else's house. And he told me that when he was getting a tour of this party, he found out that this person had a painting on his wall, which cost the amount his house cost. <laughs> and so he was joking wow. with me. He was like, that, that guy's painting, painting in the he's, house. He's got my house on his wall. Wow. <laughs> and, and that just puts things into perspective. And you think about that, like, and then you look at someone like Jeff Bezos and you think, oh, well, he's the richest man in the world, but does he have the most fame? No, he doesn't. Right. Does he have the most beauty? Uh, subjective dis right. decision. Does he have the most strength or power? Maybe not. Mm -hmm. And so no one has the most of everything. So when you measure yourself by numbers, you'll always be second, third, fourth, fifth in something. But I do feel that it's my responsibility to get my intentions right. And so one of my biggest visualizations that I do do in the morning is I so I believe that good intentions in our life are seeds and bad intentions are weeds. And so what it's I- Seeds and weeds system. Seeds and weeds. Good, and every good. single day- See what why I, he's getting the followers. <laughs> he's gonna get the likes with the seeds and weeds. Every- That's, that's very Snoop. It's very Snoop. Yeah. Yeah? Except okay. different, different yeah. seeds and yeah, different yeah. weeds. Different seeds. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. I, I like that, yeah. Thanks, mate, go on. Yeah. Uh, we'll, no, so I was saying, so what I do is I reflect on my intentions visually every day. And I think about how many deals am I taking just because they make me money or how many videos am I making just because they get me views or how much stuff am I doing just for the vanity or just for the fame or success or what I think is, is going to be good for me, like financially, economically, like how the, how the default mind is set up to think about security as opposed to love and compassion and wanting to change the world and wanting to make a different place. And I'm constantly battling with the two. So what I would do every day is I'll reflect on my intentions. I'll reflect on the deals I've just signed. I'll reflect on uh, things I'm being offered. And I'll literally look at each offer, deal, whatever it is, each item of thought. And I'll say, is that a seed or a weed? And if it's a weed, I'll pluck it out. I'll literally visualize myself plucking it out of the, the garden of my mind and pulling it out and taking it out. And if it's a seed, then I'll water it. And I'll say, okay, I want that to grow because I am doing that for the right intention. When you can be trusted with the small things and the small moments, you get trusted with more and more and more. And so like, it helps to just 
in that moment, and it's in those painful moments that you realize how powerful you are. We all know that, like you really yes. recognize it. And, and what you said was beautiful about not rushing through the pain because, and, and you know, I, I, this example's probably been shared before, but if you have a wound and you've cut yourself, it's like you can't rush the healing. You can't rush it. If you broke your arm, I mean, and you've been through so many bodily yes. injuries, you can't rush the process. It's gonna take six weeks minimum to heal a broken Correct. bone. Yeah, Correct. minimum. And you've gotta sit through that. It's you, painful. There's no injections you can take, there's no videos you can watch, there's nothing you can listen to. But our challenge is we try and rush through the pain yeah. rather than reflect through the pain. We try to rush the healing process Try to too. rush the healing and you can't rush healing and healing is meant to be slow because it buys you time, it buys you reflection, it gives you so much space. To slow down. To slow down. And that's what your body's calling out for. And this is our emergency. Like, how many times have you heard it where you slow down, you slow down, and that's when you fall ill? Because guess what? Your body has been trying to tell you to slow, slow down. down yeah. When you feel pain, so I, I write about it and think like a monk, pain makes you pay attention. Yeah. That's what pain's for. Pain's notice not. Notice this. Notice this. Look notice at me. Notice me. Look yeah. at me. It's, cra- it's like a crying baby craving yeah. for attention. When a baby's crying, you don't just go, ah, oh, it's crying. <laughs> You don't just go, oh yeah, we'll just put it in another room and forget about it, right? Like you go to it and you find its needs. Whereas with our pain, when something's painful, we're just like, oh yeah, I'll just forget about it. I'll escape from it, I'll do something else. Yeah. You have to go into that I'll pain. It. I'll numb the pain. I'll numb the pain, with that's alcohol it. alcohol or whatever. Yeah, 100%, that's, that's usually our response is, what can I do to numb this? Work more, have sex more, drink more, whatever. drugs more, whatever it is. Rather than let me actually become alert, and guess what, the pain just gets higher and, mm-hmm. higher, and higher and higher and higher because unfortunately, until it really hurts, we don't stop. Or you need more and more to numb it with. So true. Now it's incredible that we root for underdogs. It's incredible that we want underdogs to win. Why? Because we're used to wanting our team to win. We're used to wanting the best to win. We're used to wanting to associate ourselves with people who are successful, right? We never go, oh yeah, I know someone who plays for that really bad team. Like we don't say that, right? We say things like, oh, I know someone who plays for that really good team. I know someone who was MVP. I know someone who's the son or the daughter of the MVP. We try and associate or link ourselves to success. And when we do that, it in turn makes us feel more successful. It's one of the reasons why when your team wins, you say, we won. Right? You say, we won. But when someone asks you, oh, how did your team do? And if they lost that day, you say, they lost. You rarely say, we lost. It's incredible how psychologically we distance ourselves from failure and we closen or liken ourselves to success. But the exception to that rule is the underdog. We all get excited by underdogs. We all get motivated by underdogs. We feel completely enamored by the story of the underdog. Prashan, underdogs are just simple-minded. They don't have expectations and don't have anything to prove to anybody. And Prashan, you've just hit the nail on the head. That's the principle I'm trying to get across. Actually, we should play like champions and train like underdogs. Why? Because the underdog works in a way not worrying about what anybody else thinks or believes. That gives you an edge. It gives you a phenomenal advantage when you're not actually worried about what will people say, when you're not concerned by, am I going to fail? Am I going to look worse? Is what I'm doing not going to succeed? As an underdog, you don't let those things cloud your mind. You can focus in on the task at hand. See, when we become successful, even as underdogs, if we've risen to success, the biggest enemy of that success, the biggest Achilles heel, the biggest thing that can trip us up is not reconnecting to that feeling of an underdog. So no matter how much success you've achieved, no matter where you are, always remind yourself the mindset of an underdog is the mindset that nurtures talent, that nurtures success, that harnesses your true potential. What's the impact that you wanna have on the world? I think you've, you've, you've said it so beautifully so many times and shared my vision, which is wonderful, and it's wonderful to know that we, we share the same thing. It's making wisdom go viral. There's an incredible study in 2017 that said the most successful people in the world, healthy, wealthy, and wise, choose education over entertainment. The impact I wanna have on the world is I wanna transform and revolutionize the entertainment industry so that it becomes educational without anyone knowing. So it's still completely entertaining. It's still like watching Netflix but you're learning about human behavior, the mind, neuroscience, and everything without even knowing you are. To me, that's the greatest win that we can have for our society. 
How many people are gonna quit watching Netflix and reading a book every night? I don't know. But if we can make that book come to life on Netflix, that's gonna change the world because that's what people are gonna consume. So for so long, media has been used to numb people, to, to switch people off. If we can use it to excite, elevate, enlighten people, not by just, not by like the cheesy way of like, oh, let's follow someone through their journey of enlightenment. It's not like that kind of stuff. I mean like really entertaining programming where you can learn by being entertained at the same time. If I can do that by changing the, the most powerful industry in the world, then I will feel that I've had some, some what of an impact. Because that way I think we'll reach the world without having to get everyone to change their habits too much. Uh, my, my thing is how do we meet people where they are and, and really deliver a message and a powerful expression of love. And to me, that's the highest form of compassion. The highest form of empathy, love and compassion is to meet people where they already are rather than expecting them to change. Let me tell you about this girl called Cleo. I think you might know someone like her too. She had the dream of becoming a model. She said she was going to move to LA to pursue it seriously. She took care of herself, at least her body well. Someone told me she did ads for L'Oreal. She had so many followers on Instagram who all loved her. Within a minute of her posting a picture, there would be hundreds and hundreds of comments, all telling her how beautiful she was, how good she looked, comment after comment, like after like. She was a real entertainer. She was always making everyone laugh. I remember every guy wanted her number, but, but she kept to herself. She just had this infectious energy. She got along with everyone. She was always the life of the party. She was never seen in the same outfit twice. Boxes and boxes of Amazon Prime. On Instagram, she was the perfect girl with the perfect life. The perfect world with the perfect guys. But nothing's perfect, right? It seemed like she was always having the best time with her friends, always traveling new experiences and so many great stories to share. Until people started to notice. I think she lived like two lives. No one really knew her inside. She had everyone to text, but no one to talk to. Everyone to follow, but no one to walk with. When the phone was up, her world was a stage. When it was down, her reality came. She had an invite to every event, but still felt lonely. She had all the friends in the world, but still felt no one really knows me. She was going through pain, but never showed that side. It was something she hid from the world. Or maybe we just never asked. She had masked her sadness with what looked like the ideal life. She was always flying high in the air, but felt low inside. Her inbox was always full, but she felt empty within. She was happy on the outside, but struggling with depression and anxiety. She had an addiction that everyone called a lifestyle, but she was struggling with mental health but people were just occupied by her physical appearance. See, people think depression is sadness. People think depression is crying. People think depression is being quiet. Depression is when we smile, but we want to cry. It's when we talk, but we want to be quiet. It's when we pretend like we're happy, but we're not. Depression is not always obvious. She drank to drown her pain, but the pain learned how to swim. She was sick of crying, tired of trying, smiling, but inside she was dying. It's amazing how we can think we know someone and still not know them at all. I don't think we understand how stressful it is to explain what's going on in your head when you don't even understand yourself. We use filters to lighten our photos whilst we carry the heavy weight of stress. Remember, it's okay to have highlight reels, but make sure someone knows how you really feel. It's okay to use FaceTime, but make sure you spend quality time face to face. It's okay to have followers, but make sure you have true friends. Don't live for the approval of others. Document the moments you're most in love with yourself, not just the moments you think people will love the most. When someone doesn't post for a few days, we ask if they're okay. 
When someone posts every day, we assume they are. Tell people you love them. Be a trustworthy friend. Tell them that they matter. Tell them that they've survived a lot and they're ready to thrive now. People who care will ask how you're doing. People who love you will wait till you tell the truth. And that's why Robin Williams said, I used to think that the worst thing in life was to end up alone. It's not. The worst thing in life is to end up with people who make you feel alone. Something that happens is you have to surround yourself by peers in a space too who understand you and don't see you as competition. And that's really hard and it's like a fine line. I genuinely believe that collaboration wins always. So I, my whole approach to most things has always been, hey, I want to collaborate with you. Whether I'm bigger on social media or smaller on social media, I'm just like, I just want to work together because I think that's going to win long term for all of us. Both not just in terms of success and numbers, but more in terms of, I want to be friends with you. And so I reach out regularly to people that I admire in different ways. And I reach out to them and say, hey, I'd love to get to know you. I'd love to learn from you. I'd love to connect. I'd love to be a friend. Like, not I'd love to for you to teach me how you do this. And if that comes naturally from that relationship, amazing. If it never evolves into that, I've just got a great friend who now gets me. So I try and make friends in two areas. One is in an area of people who understand my life because I feel the conversations you can have with someone who does exactly what you do are just so great because they already get you, right? And uh, someone that I had on my podcast lately, her name's Lily Singh, Superwoman. Uh, she's become a recent friend. She's been incredibly and is incredibly successful on social media. She's using her platform for doing amazing good in the world. And she was someone I reached out to because I was just like, hey, like you've been doing all of this for a while. You started on YouTube a lot longer than I did. And I would just love to connect from you and hear from you. And she's become an incredible friend and we've just been sharing ideas and learning together. And it's like, that relationship's awesome. And then at the same time, I'm trying to find people who are not in media. So I still have friendships with the monks back in India. And I just spent January in India for a month. I was meditating again for, for roughly about 21 days. And I have them in my life because they remind me of like the roots and they remind me of the truths that bring me back. So I kind of like both. I love people who totally get my space. And usually those are people I reach out to. And then I love having my roots down. So most of my inner circle now is from people I've reached out to, or they become people who've been reaching out to me for a long, long time, and have been consistently reaching out to me asking for nothing. The challenge is that we think things come with emotions. Feelings. We think things come with feelings and emotions, and guess what they don't. So if you chase money. Well, they might for a moment, right? Or they won't. I don't think they even do. It's, a false sense it's of such feeling. a false sense of feeling. I don't. Uh -huh. Maybe for a moment, but it's so short-lived that it's it's not even worth counting almost. Mm -hmm. So it's like when you when you think that I'm chasing money. Guess what? You will get money. Yep. And that's great. Money is really important. Money is a really important resource. But guess what? Money is not now going to fill that gap, that void, that feeling, that emotion that you're missing in your life. What are and most so, people missing? We're missing a deep sense of love. I think, I think the biggest need in the world, as we've heard many times before from all the ancient texts, they, they, they summarize it like this, to love and be loved. Like that is the need of humanity, to love and be loved. And when we don't experience that, we then start looking for status. We then start looking for money. Then we then start looking for recognition. To, to help us give the feeling of false sense of love. Correct. And the challenge is because most of us didn't experience that from our parents, and this is the key thing, what we crave in life is what we did or didn't get from our parents. Mm -hmm. What our parents did give us is what we continue to crave, or what they didn't give us is what we continue to crave. Mm -hmm. So you'll find that most people's love languages that they chase are things that their parents didn't give them. So if their parents didn't give them time, they now crave everyone's time. If their parents didn't give them gifts, gifts they crave gifts. If their parents didn't give them acts of service, they, they're craving those acts of service. So it's because of our childhood. And if we don't learn to process all of that experience, which most people never get the time to do, and, and I empathize with that because I've had to go through that. I've seen me repeating my parents' patterns. Mm. I've what seen was the thing you were craving? So I would crave 
A big thing for me was I would crave surprises and gifts because that's your thing. Yeah, yeah. that's my thing. Still is your thing. It's still my thing. Yeah. And and I did your parents not do that for you? No, or? they did. A, my mom did a lot of it. That's why so, you still crave correct. it. Correct. So my mom would always every year on my birthday, she'd always surprise me with the one thing I wanted. And I wasn't spoiled growing up. I didn't yeah, have a yeah. lot growing up. But she would get that one thing, whether it was like a Power Rangers toy right. or whether it was whatever it was, you yeah. know, something you Video know. Game yeah, thing is, you want as a kid, right? And she would always surprise me with that. And that became so deep rooted. Now I'll give you an example. When I then married my wife, you just expect people to know that. That they're gonna do the same thing. Totally. And well, so now- She didn't you, do that. No, because I'm expecting my wife to be like my mom in the sense of I expected a surprise or show me love in the same way. Uh -huh. And she doesn't know that. She's not a mind reader. I can't explain, expect her to know that. So it took communication. It took yeah. time for me to explain that. So anyway, th I think that's where it stems from. That desire, it doesn't come from any, you can say it comes from society and education. Of course it does. But I think the deepest place it comes is what your parents did or didn't give you. Mm -hmm. that's, that's where yeah. it comes from. Yeah. In the middle of 2009, he was the software engineer that no one wanted to hire. He had 12 years of experience at Yahoo, but he was rejected by Facebook and then rejected by Twitter. He'd been to a great university. He had a great CV, but he decided to team up with one of his alumni members at Yahoo and started to create an app and focus on the startup space. In five years time, he sold that app for $19 billion to Facebook. Believe it or not, that was Brian Acton, the co-founder of WhatsApp. When he was rejected from Facebook, he said it was a great opportunity to connect with some fantastic people. I look forward to life's next adventure. When he was rejected by Twitter, he responded by saying, worked out, it was quite a long commute. It's so interesting to see that someone rejected from two of the top internet companies actually responded with humor and actually responded with positivity. This lady was diagnosed with clinical depression. Her marriage had failed and she was jobless with a dependent child. She was on a four hour delayed train journey from Manchester to London when she came up with this idea and she started to write this book about this wizard. And as she started writing, she then finished her manuscript, took it to 12 publishers and was rejected by all 12. Believe it or not, that's JK Rowling. This man watched his first company crumble. He was a Harvard University dropout and his first company's demo didn't even work. He went on to build Microsoft. His name's Bill Gates. Therefore, failure is just a sign that we need to widen our scope. We need to be ready and build ourselves up for the next level. Actually, what we end up achieving is far greater than what we'd envisioned for ourselves. And this divine plan, this orchestration can't be happening without this intervention that occurs because if we had it our way, we just settle, we just accept what we thought was our goal, what we thought we were chasing. But actually I've noticed that when you don't get that later down the line, you look back and you reflect and realize that what you've gained is so much greater. Failures are only failures when we don't learn from them because when we learn from them, they become lessons and we actually extrapolate all of these teachings and actually get more insight into how we can improve the way we work and how we can actually drive with a different energy. The challenge we have is that we only talk about people's failures when they succeed and that's why they become this taboo or we feel like their failures never happened. We need to share these stories earlier. We need to bring out these stories and experiences on the journey so that people who are on the journey can actually follow in those footsteps. And that's why Steve Jobs said you can't connect the dots moving forward. You only can when you're looking backwards. Fred Smith was an undergraduate at Yale University in 1965. As part of his coursework, he wrote an economics paper exploring the transportation of goods in the United States. It's how things get delivered to you and me. He found that shippers were transporting large packages and items either via truck or through passenger airplanes. He thought he had a more efficient method. He wrote a last minute paper, as you do, about how a company transporting small items via a plane would be a much better business model. Because he was rushed, he never really got around to explaining in the paper how that company would run and he ended up getting a C. The funny thing is, he still didn't give up and in 1971, he actually launched the company he was speaking about. But within three years of founding the company, Federal Express, as it was called, was actually on the verge of bankruptcy. They were losing over a million a month. 
month. That was because of rising fuel costs, competitors in the same market, and at its zenith, it was only worth about $5,000. Smith even made a final pitch to General Dynamics hoping for more funding, and it was rejected. Most people at this point probably would have just shut down. Rejection, the grade C, losing a million a month. But Fred Smith had different ideas. Smith actually ended up flying to Las Vegas that weekend with all of what the company had, the $5,000. The Monday morning after, the company had $32,000 thanks to his blackjack skills. That money made it possible to cover fuel costs for just a few days more. Soon after the company was able to raise significant funds, he went around to multiple places to find sponsors, investors, people that believed in what he was trying to achieve as a service. The amazing thing is that he was creating a company that we all know today. It's called FedEx. It now operates in over 220 countries and has an annual revenue of over 45 billion dollars. The interesting lesson that we can learn here is that there were countless occasions in Fred Smith's life where he could have said, that's it, it's not working for me. He could have stopped when he got that C for the paper. He could have stopped when he was losing a million a month. He could have even stopped when he finally only had enough to just last a few more days. But he believed in his vision. He had belief, he had conviction about his idea and the process and the service that he was creating. And that's the lesson here. If you really really want to achieve something, you'll find a way. And if you don't, you'll find excuses. There are some times when I'm with a social media person who says something really useful for my roots. And there's someone times when I'm with roots and they say something else. And there's a great story actually about when the prime minister of India, Modi, he visited Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg interviewed him at Facebook at the headquarters. And Mark Zuckerberg told a story. He said that when he was struggling with the direction of Facebook in 2009, he went up to his mentor to ask a question. Now, Mark Zuckerberg's mentor happened to be Steve Jobs. And so he went up to Steve Jobs and he said, Steve, I'm struggling with the direction of Facebook. What do I do? And at that time, you know, I mean, Steve Jobs is Steve Jobs. He could have said anything and mm -hmm. it would have made sense. But, you know, he could have said, go and meet a venture capitalist. He could have said, go and meet an investor. He could have said, go and meet a tech company. He could have said, I'll tell you what to do. Instead, he said, I think you need to go to India and spend some time in an ashram, a monastery in India with monks. He goes, when you do that, you'll find the answer of what you wanna do. And to me, that is exactly why the people that are most successful in this world are successful, because they surround themselves with people who have differing beliefs. And MIT did a research study on this. They found that people who are more innovative and creative in an organization knew people who didn't know each other. So when you know people who all know each other, you end up with the same answer, the same belief and confirmation bias exists mm -hmm. and you just keep building that echo chamber. Whereas if you've got two people who don't agree and you get a checking system, then you can trust your gut and go with what you believe. So I think I try and move away from having people around me and it's not just yes men or yes women, it's about, it's not just about that, it's about building a circle of people, like you said, that want different things for you and knowing what they want for you. So when I'm with my mom, all my mom cares about is my health, <laughs> right? My mom does not care how successful I am, how many videos I have, how many people I help, even that. And my mom will get over that. She's like, how's your health? Like, are you taking care of yourself? Are you sleeping well? Are you eating well? Like, that's my mom. And it's like, if I go and I measure everything most of that, that's wrong. But if I know that that's what my mom wants for me, that's beautiful. That's what I get from her. And she'll take care of that. And same, you know, everyone plays a different role in your life. Don't expect everyone to play the role you want and don't expect everyone to play the same role. Recognize that everyone's playing their role in your life and let them play it. That's what makes a good movie. If everyone played the same role in a movie, it'd be boring. Very boring. Yeah. Every day we recharge our phones, but we forget to recharge ourselves. Let's just say we slept well the night before, which means we start our day with 100% charge. When we wake up in the morning, we roll over and 80% of us check our smartphones before we brush our teeth. We scroll through social media, we browse through emails. That takes away 10% of our energy. Let's say we now have 90% charge left. We then commute to work. We spend our day in the office, in meetings, interacting with colleagues, finishing off projects and assignments we now have 40% charge left. On the way home, we commute through traffic or on the train, and that takes away another, let's say 10%. We now have 30% charge left. 
We come home and switch on Netflix, talk to someone about what our day was like, and sometimes we lose another 10%. We now have 20% charge left. At 20% on our phones, usually the charge bar goes red. We get an alert. We get a message that tells us that we only have 20% battery left. The question is, do we notice when our charge is at 20% or 10%? There are always signs from our bodies, our brains, our minds. But are we tuned in? One of the best things we can do to recharge is to exercise. The hardest part of any workout is actually the 15 minutes leading up to it. We come up with 15 reasons why we don't want to sweat and we change our mind 15 different times. CNN reports that when you work out, your brain creates more serotonin, which sends messages to your nervous system of happiness and well-being. Working out for 30 to 40 minutes every day can recharge our battery by 20%. Meditation is an incredible way to recharge our batteries. Exactly what the gym does for the body, meditation can do for the mind. Meditation gives us downtime, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Meditation also directly impacts your entire nervous system by reducing your body's productions of stress-related chemicals such as cortisol. Meditation is a great way to recharge and can take you back up 20%. We've all heard about incredible morning routines, but the one thing that can make a huge difference to your recharge is your evening routine. 35% of us are not getting the recommended seven hours of sleep per night. Remember, every body and mind is different. Make sure you find the amount of time you need to get that serious battery recharge. And the 75-year study by Harvard found that beyond anything, the real sense check for happiness and meaning in life was relationships, connections, interactions with depth that are fulfilling and full of joy. Making time for deep, meaningful interactions every day can give the recharge our battery seriously needs. What if we've recharged ourselves as much as we recharge our phones. Because if we don't, we'll end up like one of our phones in the bottom of some drawer in our home. Here's the shocking truth about loneliness. This is why we need to take it more seriously. Surveys show one out of three adults are lonely and the health impacts of loneliness are shocking. Studies have shown that people who are lonely are 50% more likely to die before their time. Researchers show that loneliness is as damaging to our health as not smoking one, not two, but 15 cigarettes per day. Only around half of Americans say they have meaningful, face-to-face -face interactions with a loved one, family or friend every single day. Members of Generation Z say they are the loneliest generation and experience more health problems as a result of it. Loneliness was also linked with less physical activity, compulsive use of digital technology, and not being able to share our problems with others. In a study of 20,000 adults, 54% say that they don't know one person that knows them well. Additionally, 56% of people said that the people they surround themselves with are not necessarily with them and approximately 40% said that they lack companionship, don't have meaningful relationships, and feel isolated. All of us have been in a crowd but felt lonely. All of us have been invited to a party but wanted to leave. All of us have likes on social media but don't feel loved in real life. So many of us can get comments on our posts but can't get a friend to call us back. Loneliness is real. So here's what we have to do. After studying over 2,500 consumers over six years, research found that people that see material possessions as a sign of success felt more lonely. Investing our money in experience rather than things is a great way of breaking the loneliness and materialism cycle. Schedule a time each day to talk to a friend. Take a class to learn something new. Volunteer to deepen your sense of purpose. Spend time with people who look more like your future than your past. The mental health charity Mind cites two factors 
that can cause loneliness. Someone either not having enough social contact or more interestingly, being surrounded by people but not feeling understood, loved or cared for. Notice, it's not just being around people but being understood. It's not just being invited and present but feeling like you're contributing. Loneliness really comes then from a lack of significance or lack of worth and what you bring to the table and what value you truly offer. Lonely is not being alone. It's the feeling that no one loves you. So start by loving yourself. I read an incredible study that changed the way I create and think. And it said that the human mind can't be logical and creative at the same time. How many of you have ever walked from a highly creative brainstorm where you were fueled with passion and then had to talk about numbers and business and, right? It's tough, right? Anyone ever found that quite difficult? It's quite challenging and the mind's like trying to run from one side of the brain to the other side of the brain. So what I do is I create in depth. So I go really deep into my creation and then I go really deep into everything else that I have to do. So before I went to India, I created my content in advance. And so when I was in India, I was able to really switch off. So the beauty of being able to be in India for 21 or 30 days, or wherever I am in the world for that matter, I'm then not having to think of creativity as stress or pressure. I'm able to do creativity as a form of passion and service. And so when I was in India, I was able to not look at Instagram. I was able to not look at Facebook. I was able to completely switch off for 21 days when I was there earlier in January. And I started my year in the way I wanted to. So I was meditating for eight hours a day. I was spending time with my teachers who are mind-blowing and incredible and trying to learn from them and take in knowledge and wisdom from them and continuously praying to be of more service this year and make a difference this year. So that's how I chose to spend my January. And I had so many people saying to me, they were just like, Jay, it's January. Things are going well in your career. How can you take 21 days off? Right, that pressure, that noise. I was like, things are going good for you. How can you take time off? I was like, things are going good because I'm doing this. Right? Like, you know, I had one of my teachers that has kept saying to me for years, he goes, if you want to move three steps forward, you have to go three steps deep. And so if I'm not going forward, I know it's because I haven't gone deep. So for me, that's a big priority for me. And that's what I try and do when I'm, not, I try and do that every day, but I also believe in immersive experiences. So a lot of us today, we live in this world, which is like 10 minutes a day. Do it for 10 minutes a day, everything will be great. And that is great. There's nothing wrong with that. But imagine you spent with a boy or a girl, your partner, whoever it was, someone that you just started dating. Imagine you spent 10 minutes a day with them. How long would it take you to figure out whether you wanted to fall in love with them or not? <laughs> Probably a long time. And so when you go immersive, if you spend a weekend away with someone, you know whether you like them or not. And meditation, mindfulness, all these habits are the same. The more you immerse yourself, the more you get an experience that stays with you, the more that you can live with that experience and keep going back to it for 10 minutes a day. So I really believe in immersive experiences. I love the 10 minute a day advice, but I also deeply believe in having a deep, immersive, absorbed experience that completely takes over your whole body, mind, and soul. In 2016, I moved out to New York. So just let me paint a picture of 2016. I moved three jobs. I got married. Wow. I moved country and I, just, just started a whole new life. Like my life just transformed. So we went through all of that with my wife yes. in one year. And by the way, all of that was surprises. The job change was surprises. Yeah. The country change was a surprise. The marriage was not a surprise. We planned right, right, that. Right, right, right. But apart from everything else, everything was a surprise. Now I said I like surprises so I can <laughs> roll with it. But my point is that's a lot of transition in a so year. So much transition. And I felt the burden of being in a new city where we had no family, we had no friends. And my wife, who loves being around her family and no one understands just how close she is to them, I felt this burden on me that I had taken away her time with her mm. family and now she was alone. So I was going out to work and she'd be crying at home. Mm. And I was thinking, she's got no friends, she's got no support. And I know you can relate to this yes. with moving and it's relationships lot, and so much going on. And so it's like, I'm dealing with that. And guess what, six months later, I have to leave and move on and work on a new career to build everything myself and then I'm four months away from being broke. And so on top of all of this, I've now got four months away from being broke. 
I've got enough money money saved for four months to pay for rent and groceries, and in that's New York it. City. In New yeah. York City, and that's <laughs> it. And guess what? Even on top of that, I've got 30 days before my visa runs out and I'm kicked out of the country, so I can't even live here anymore. So not only have I just got married, moved job three times, changed career again, had to move into a apartment, money. four months of being broke, and I might get kicked out in 30 days, and my renewal for my visa cost $15,000. Oh. So that's gonna eat into those four months. I have probably never been under that much emotional, yeah. physical, and, and mental pressure in my life. Like genuinely, I felt it. And I felt my body change. My, my breath was more stressed. I would be breathing faster, shorter, shorter breaths, not deep breaths, heartbeat not faster, working not working out. You get into lazy habits, you start craving junk food. Sugar to get energy. I'm yeah. living in a 500 square foot apartment with my wife, which is, which is tiny, like everything's in that space. And guess what, we both work from home. So I'm now sitting at a desk, hunched over, trying to figure stuff out. She's trying to cook in the same room. Like I'm trying to, just, just trying to figure out what to do. And I remember the next morning, sending like a hundred emails to people and just being like, this is who I am, this is what I can do, how can we serve? And that was the same year that I ended up meeting you later yeah. in that year. Mm -hmm. And the beginning three months of that journey was so stressful, like they were so stressful because I was like, what if I have to move back to London? What am I gonna say to her parents? I mean, I just took their daughter away. Like, uh, <laughs> just I've got only, married. I've yeah. lived in New York City for six months, and my life's falling apart. Like, you know, so much, and I've got all these views, but there's nothing. There's nothing mm. happening. And we met. But you also, you also. I mean, at this time, you're also growing so much. How are you able to create and reach this impact with your videos? Yeah. That's growing while you're under so much stress and uncertainty. And I stopped a bit at that time, like things slowed down hard, like things slowed down. I remember that. I, I wasn't creating as much as I was because I don't enjoy creating from stress or pressure, and I don't think you can really create something from stress and pressure, so we really slowed down at that time. And when I was creating, I was creating from a place of recognizing that I could share what I had learned and what I had grown in so far. So anything I was sharing was like, this is what I've learned so far. So that was the biggest pain that I've been through in the last seven years, wow. for sure. And all I can say is that I remember coming home to my wife knowing that this was gonna be the truth. And I came home and I said to her, I said to her, I guarantee you, this is gonna be the best thing that ever happened to us. What, the pain? The pain. I said that to her the night I came home wow. and then she gave up to that. I literally came home, I looked her in the eyes and go, this is the scenario. And I just want you to know that I guarantee you to you, this is the best thing that's ever gonna happen to us. And I said to her, and this is, this is a monk statement that we used to repeat, I said to her, I'm just not gonna judge the moment. Don't judge the moment, because what we do is we try to label moments as good or bad. And when you label a moment as bad, it now does not have the opportunity to become good. I'll give an example, if I go, I don't like this book, this book's bad, right? And I don't, and I love this book. Yeah, yeah. But if I say that, sure. guess what? I will never pick it up and recognize the value that's inside of it because you've labeled it. Yes. And we label stuff, like we label, oh, that restaurant's bad. Mm. But when you label a that moment, person's bad, that now. person's bad, now you can't learn from that person. Oh, a great one, that's a really good one. Mm. As soon as you start labeling people or anything as good or bad, you limit it. You stop it from being something else. And here's the truth, every moment can evolve into being anything if you give it the opportunity to. Right. But as soon as you say it's got no value anymore, you lose it. And so for me, I had to say to myself, don't judge the moment. And I'd keep repeating that don't to myself. Don't judge where you're at. Don't judge What's this. happening. Yeah, don't judge it as negative. Don't, don't just start saying it's negative. Because guess what, we've all been in positions where a gift turned into a curse and a curse turned into a That's gift. That's true. Right? We've also where our dreams came true and it ended up not being what we wanted. Exactly. And it fell apart and it led us into the, our dreams. Totally. Why is it that so many people that win the lottery yeah. go broke? Yeah. Gifts can turn into curses That's too. True. But because we label them as the best moment in our life or the worst moment in our life. Whereas when you approach things to neutrality and just what you have on the table, you can be like, okay, what am I going to do next? How have you related to deep spiritual learnings and at the same time being happy and content in the material world without going crazy? <laughs> Interesting question. I think that's the point of spiritual training. So it's like when we're, when we're immature in our spiritual learning, we're just starting out. When you first learn the first, everyone remember the first time they learned something? And they were like, I'm never talking to my family ever again, right? It's like, because you, you learn a little bit and you go, oh my God, I've been doing it all wrong. 
and now I can't talk to that person, I can't ever go to that event again, and you start making all these big decisions based on something small that you've learned. And so I think in the beginning of our lives, because to protect ourselves, which is a very normal desire and very good and very human, we think, okay, I need to take care of this, so now I'm gonna shut out from all of this. But as we grow, we realize we can give more back. And so one of the ways I've always thought about it is, if you look at the ocean and you see someone drowning, you wanna help them. But if you go in too soon and you're not strong enough, it's likely that you're gonna get pulled in. And at that point, it's easier to shout out to a lifeguard who can come along, who's trained, who's disciplined, who's committed, who can go and make a difference. And so for me in my life, I'm always looking at if I can't bring someone up, I'm not gonna spend time with them if they're gonna pull me down. And it's drawing that line for me. So if I've been ever scared about my spirituality, rather than putting them down and going, oh, I'm not spending time with them because I'm putting them down, if I can't lift them up, then I'm gonna protect myself by not being dragged down. But if I can pull them up, if I can lift them up, then that's when I'm able to go into that space and make an impact and make a difference. And that line has really helped me not go crazy because now I'm not doing it based on a judgment of them, I'm reflecting on my own abilities and flaws and, and the difference I can make. And I'm taking a, taking a stance. It's like someone asked me the other day, what is a complaint? And we were talking about litter. A complaint is you see a piece of trash on the floor and you go, oh, LA's so dirty. You've removed the agency that you can have an impact on that. A statement is, oh, LA's a bit dirty, there's trash on the floor, I'm gonna pick that up and throw it away. Right, taking that responsibility. So when we're irresponsible in our spiritual lives, we judge everyone and judge everything. And we mature, we start looking at through compassion, empathy, and connection, and recognize we were just there a few years ago. And that's the biggest anchor in my life, is recognizing that I was addicted to, and still am in different ways, things that I don't believe are good for me spiritually, and I was that, I was that guy, I was that kid, you know? And it's taken a journey, and someone had to believe in me. Someone had to invest in me. Someone had to reach their hand without being forced in and pull me out. And so that allows me to continue to operate in the world. I hope that answers your question. If you want another amazing Jay Shetty video, check it out right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. Don't start your journey of saying, I wanna be a movie director because I wanna, you know, I wanna hit the blockbuster charts, so I wanna do this. Don't make it about that. 